we witness these realities on a daily basis as we wrestle with them over our entire lives, even as we try to build a beloved community here in South Orange Maplewood and elsewhere. It seems to me that a central question for us in this moment of ongoing and unfolding historical harm, in whatever electoral cycle it might be, is this. How do we resist pessimism that threatens to fragment us? And how do we create the conditions of abundance that all of us need, including space for more joy, more creativity, more safety, love, and possibility? These are the kinds of questions that sit with me, sit in me as we gather here tonight and that motivate my work, my research, and my teaching. Luckily, our guests here each week work with some aspect of those questions from their particular points of view and their various lanes. We were going to start with Dr. Muhammad, but uh, since he will join us shortly, I'm going to turn to Dr. Costa White. That was not what I <laughs> Um, since he's not here, you get to go. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. White, uh, for your time this evening. This is going to be fun, Dr. White. Dr. Carl White. You all can guess why we will have the same last name. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, we have all witnessed the harm of uh, so-called post-racial politics and the backlash to the presidency of Barack Obama. Into this recent history is Kamala Harris's historic run for President of the United States. We know that this moment is both exciting and fraught. So the question to you to get us started, what are your thoughts about the political and cultural terrain that a black woman president will be stepping into? Not, not a big question, no. no. <laughs> And it's just, to, it's just to get us started, and, and uh, a sub-question, because you know we have to be annoying as academics with our sub-questions. <laughs> what can you imagine we must do to prepare for what will be a future backlash to uh, a President Harris's uh, uh, administration that might be similar to the political, cultural, and social upheavals that we witnessed mm -hmm. after the election of our first uh, black president? Presidency represents for a lot of people. 
is America be better than we think it could be or it has been? Um, and so there's that. There's this like rightness of, of you know, like, you know, I, I always like to crumble everybody when I do my Tea Party talk where I'm like, everybody's like, Obama will have a magical spell that will change race in America, right? But I mean, we had this feeling at least. Um, and then I think Harris is also being brought in in the midst of a crisis, but like they're like crises of silence. So that it's like a very different kind of thing, right? When it's economy or perceived as an economic recession, everybody wants to talk about it. When it's like an ongoing pandemic that is killing, like still killing a thousand people a week, we don't talk about it, right? Or um, when it's what most scholars in the world are calling the ongoing genocide that our tax dollars are going to, like there's a silence around that. Um, and so I wonder, you know, I do think, despite our sadness, both of those things are going to occupy the presidency, actually. Um, you know, they're saying so far, like, Social Security has been seeing a huge um, swelling, at least people, people getting or receiving disability. Um, but we are seeing, like, a huge percentage of people who are getting long COVID or disabled by it. So I think that those kinds of things will, will manifest. And also, like, even this week, this whole, like, now pagers are exploding and walkie-talkies are exploding. This kind of cyber terrorism thing, I think, is going to be a part of Harris's presidency, actually. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine it staying isolated to the Middle East, I think. A lot of times the things that we bring there have a way of traveling elsewhere. So I think that stuff is going to pop up. Um, so I think one of the questions, and like, Barbara, you tell me, because I know I've got this like five minutes. Let me try to go over. Okay. Um, one of the things that we've seen, so the question then is like, are we ready for a black woman presidency? One of the things we've seen over the last decade is around the world, we've seen tons of, I shouldn't say tons, but we've seen women presidents in lots of places India, Mexico, um, Ethiopia, Italy, Germany. Like, you know, we've seen women leaders, South America, Peru. Like, we've seen women leaders elected. We have a model now of what it really looks like. We've had it for you know, years, I mean, go back to Martin Thatcher, blah, blah, blah. So I think, um, and we like poll people generally, depending on how you ask the question, people generally say they're ready for a woman president. And when I say generally, I'm like at least 51%, right? So it's not pushing us over, but the good news is like women tend to vote more, women support Harris more than men do. So, like, you know, I think the polls in general are leaning towards her. So, I mean, if you're talking about like electoral prospects, yeah, I could say America's ready for like anybody but Trump in certain ways, um, or at least like the number of people are. But I think for me, the question really is like, well, what does a black woman presidency mean for us? Like, for us as black people, for us as just people who are invested in this country? Um, and that, that in certain ways brings me back to Gaza, for example. Like, Gaza in certain ways was a black vote issue. Like, 60% of black Americans said they wanted a condition. Um, based on whether or not Israel was holding up uh, human rights and what they're doing in Gaza. Um, and Harris has just said, no, I'm not doing that, right? So there's like an engagement there with black voters and like what black voters want. Um, and I think about like Obama in certain ways when he was president. Y'all remember when there was like a kid that like, comes to the White House at one point and he was killed or she was killed later on? And so Obama went to Chicago and he gave a speech. Um, and part of that speech was like about black parents and how they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So it's like, which is like a crazy speech. Like, you don't go to a funeral and like, <laughs> you know, talk bad about the people. Somebody who just lost their daughter, for example, right? Um, you don't talk about it. So we have to, so I'm really wrestling with what Harris has had to do in this, you know, people are going to tap to the center, this idea of she, her appealing. So she's like, I'll put a Republican in my cabinet. Um, I don't care so much about fracking anymore. I don't support the Green New Deal. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's that. And, we'll, and part of it is because she's up against um, what like, this scholar of Brooklyn Gibson calls weaponized misogyny, which is, like, misogyny was a term. Um, no, not Brittany. Uh, I'll think of it. Um, but she comes, she's at 
But she uh, came up with it to really talk about the way that misogyny gets targeted towards black women in particular. Um, so if y'all think about welfare policy, for example, the welfare queens, that is like a misogyny law trope, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Moya um, Bailey. And, like, and, and so we see a lot of that mobilizing policy, and she's working against that in a certain way. And that is why she's performing as she is. So anyway, I'm wrestling with what her her election will mean, not just for her, but also like when we have this kind of identity and we have this investment in this identity, what does it mean that we can get out of it? And what can she do in operating in that space? And Khalil was here, so 